Hey guys, and welcome to the Karima Podcast, where we talk about business, finance, entrepreneurship, and real estate. I'm your host, Jason Karima, and I have a very special guest today, Brandon Vargas. Man, it's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on. I, I'm, I'm excited to talk real estate. Yeah. Uh, so it sounds like you're you're pretty busy with a lot of deals going on. Uh, tell me about some of the projects that you have going on right now. Yeah. So um, I got two flips going on right now and um, have an apartment complex um, that we're constantly working on. Yeah. Um, and then in the newest uh, venture is kind of getting into the industrial and commercial space. So tell me a little bit about the that industrial space that you guys are working on. So yeah, um, just being principal owners. So you know we're looking to acquire land, um, develop, um, go vertical on some buildings, um, lease those out, and then also um, buy existing stuff. So it's been a lot of fun, like kind of learning the space. Um, you know what lease rates are at um, for the area, um, what a building can be turned into. Um, looking at like bigger square footage buildings, uh, typically you know ten, twenty, thirty thousand. Um, because with those red iron buildings, usually you can just build out the space that you're looking for. So, you know, if we were to develop a 20,000 square foot building, um, we could have, you know, four or 5,000 square foot units in there and have four tenants, nice. um, that are all paying you rent. So, um, yeah, it's pretty exciting and interesting, uh, avenue of real estate. Yeah. yeah. So what got you into real estate or originally? Man, um, baseball, um, was my journey through real estate. So I was a big baseball guy. And, um, you know, we all have our own plans in life. And, you know, I think that God has bigger plans than, than we do. Absolutely. And um, I wanted to play in the majors. And um, I'm left-handed. I throw 90. I still throw 90. Dang. I want to be that 40-year-old that can throw 90. I don't know if I'm <laughs> going to get there. Um, but I'm short. That's the, that's the one downside. So, you know, um, those major league teams don't like short pitchers, even if you throw 90. <laughs> mm, yeah. But, um, you know, I uh, thought I was going to get drafted. I had a really good junior and senior year. Um, didn't end up happening. So I wanted to continue that journey um, and trying to play baseball. So I went and played independent baseball. And uh, through that, I met uh, Ryan Pineda. Um, he's a pretty big guy over in Las Vegas area. And, um, you know, kind of connected with him because I'm a Christian and we did Bible study and, you know, just trying to um, deepen my faith with the Lord. Yeah. And um, didn't really have a second plan other than like being a coach or a teacher or something because I just loved baseball that much. Mm -hmm. And just through him constantly posting on social media, you know, he was starting to get into real estate and starting to do big things over there in his area. And it just kind of um, got my wheels spinning on real estate. Like, okay, what are you doing? Like, what is this real estate thing? Enough to like really make me, he's like, hey, go read this book, go listen to the podcast, you know, um, get on Bigger Pockets. That yeah. was a lot of people's first, you know, introductions into real estate. And just, um, you know, get as much information as you can before you go do your first deal. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of what got me started. It gave me the real estate bug, like kind of really seeing the different um, streams of income that you can make through real estate. And that's when, so I started learning all that stuff, you know, 2013, 14, 15, and then finally did our first deal in 2017. Um, tell me a little bit about that first deal. It was a headache. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I would encourage people, the only reason it was a headache is because we want to do as much stuff as we could ourselves. Mm. Um, I, I am not good with the hammer. I I don't really want to be good with the hammer because then I can't leverage my time for more deals. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it was a headache, but it was a good learning process because through that, like I learned like, oh, this is how tile is supposed to look. This is how tile is supposed to be laid. Um, this is how, you know, LVP is supposed to be laid. This is what it's supposed to look like. This is how paint's supposed to be done. This is the time framing supposed to be done. So um, if you don't have a construction background already, I'd encourage you to get your hands dirty and um, learn that. Um, we did end up making money on that deal, but it was like, you know, not nearly as much as you were hoping for. Yeah. And that was mainly through holding costs. Like we just held the property a lot longer than we wanted to mm -hmm. because we were doing the work ourselves. So yeah, I've been there, done that. I will, I will give some credit too as well with uh, my wife's cousins. They helped us through that. Um, a lot of headache, a lot of cuss words, probably. Um, I remember, um, what are they called? Um, uh, those iron um, tubs, they're like super cast iron. Yeah. I mean, like oh, man, just heavy. like a 300 pound tub and two men are like struggling, sweating, trying to lift this thing out mm -hmm. to demo it. And so we have that memory for that house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So, uh, so how would you advise someone if they're wanting to get to where you're at now like what are some of those steps that they need to go through to be able to do that yeah so um 
I would say like find find out what you're truly passionate about first. You know, whether it's real estate, whether it is um, construction, whether it's um, Airbnbs. You know, there's so many different um, ways to get through real estate. Like I've done a couple Airbnbs as well, and we didn't mention that earlier. Um, some people have more of a of a grasp on like design, and they like um, hospitality, which is you know what Airbnb is. So mm-hmm. one like finding your true passion first, because if you're passionate about something, like you'll go after it even through the failures that you're gonna have. Yeah, and you're gonna have a lot of failures. Yeah, right. Um, we always say fail forward, right? Don't just you know be down in the dumps. So find out what you're passionate about. Um, and to surround yourself with people that are going to encourage you and help you be successful as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can't, you can't go through this life alone. You shouldn't. Yeah. Um, so finding those mentors or those people that have done it and just ask them questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to fail. Get enough information, um, to where you're finally able to make that decision, like to go in. Don't have analysis paralysis. Um, don't be afraid for failure because like I said, like you have to fail forward mm. and you can't be afraid to take action. You know, you can learn all this stuff in the world. You can read a million books. You can listen to the podcast, but you have to take action. Yeah. Um, that's, so, yeah. I think that's everyone, like the majority of people's downfall is they don't take action. They'll think like, Oh, I don't know everything yet. And they'll think they have to know everything. Like, like, I'm a little bit on the side where like, I don't know enough and I'll go forward with it and I'll just figure it out because it's, that's typically worked well for us. Like we just, we, we might not know that much about it, but we're like constantly pushing the envelope and trying to make it happen. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, you know, that's the right attitude to have. I mean, um, that's kind of what's going on with the industrial stuff. Like, um, I have an idea of how it works. Um, I've never done development but you're going to figure it out along the way. And, you know, luckily with my partner, he's done um, a lot more industrial than I have. And so I can pick his brain. Like I said, find a mentor, find that person that you can ask the questions and don't be afraid to ask the questions. You're not going to look stupid. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, I think you look smarter because if you're the smartest person in the room, then you're like, in the wrong room. You're in the wrong room. Like yeah. you're never going to be constantly learning. Yeah. You know, there's guys that are doing real estate in their fifties and sixties that are still learning to this day. Right. They're, they're never going to know it all. Yeah. So you got to be able to ask the questions and take action. Yeah. Yeah. So what does believe in yourself mean to you? Man, that's deep right there. <laughs> um, no, that's good. That's great. Um, yeah, just like being afraid to learn and take action. I think believing in yourself is like always being able to level up with yourself, like level up to that next version of yourself that you truly see yourself becoming. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if I'm if I'm not learning, if I'm not getting better every day, um, are you truly believing yourself to like take action to like, you know, talk to that next person to hit the next workout, you know, try and do five more pounds on bench press, whatever, right? If you don't believe in yourself, how are you going to achieve it? Yeah. Um, so that's like the first step, right? You got to believe in yourself and then have the passion to to go pursue that, yeah. to pursue whatever it is that you're trying to pursue. Absolutely. And I, I tie it into confidence a lot. Like if you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to have the confidence to go out and take action. And so if you just have to find it within yourself or find something that's motivating for you to go out and do the hard things. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, confidence is huge. Like, it's funny. I feel like as we get older, sometimes, at least for me, um, I don't know if social media has done this to me or becoming a father. Um, you kind of lose confidence sometimes in yourself. Um, I think social media, that's why social media can be bad Mm -hmm. because you can have this perception of how people see you. Yeah. But I feel like really the only true perception that you should care about is your Lord. Yeah. You know, and how Um, God sees you and how God sees you, you know? And so through that guidance, you know, he wants you to believe in yourself and he wants you to be able to successful and be the leader of your family and of other of other individuals, right? Mm-hmm. So if you can just block out all the noise um, and just go after what you truly believe in your heart, yeah. like there's nothing that can stop you, mm-hmm. you know? And it's a lot easier said than done, right? A hundred percent, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, you go through those stages where you're just like on a high of like, oh, I can do anything, and then you might, you know, tone it down a second, but it'd be nice to just stay on the high for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's me constantly. Like every day throughout the day, I'm like, okay, I'm doing good. Oh crap. Everything sucks. Everything's good. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. So you just got to 
put out those fires, block out all the noise and get back to, um, you know, the happy medium. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some goals that you're working on right now? And then what are some goals that maybe five, 10, 15 years out you're wanting to accomplish? I'd say currently, um, just working on time blocking better, honestly, Mm -hmm. because if you you don't time block well, um, there's so much that can go through your mind. Like we have, you know, no 20,000, however, whatever that number is that you see on Facebook, on Instagram of thoughts going through our head. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I have ADHD, so it's probably way more than that. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so just being able to block that out and, and truly like, okay, what are the, the items that are going to move my day forward and allow me to be successful, allow me to make money. Right. Because at the end of the day, we got to make money to support our families and grow our businesses. Um, so yeah, like time blocking and, um, pursuing those items that, um, allow us to learn and grow. So like, that's what I'm working on personally. Um, and just the industrial stuff, like it's super important to me. So I'm kind of allocating, you know, 20 to 30 hours, 30 hours a week on just that. And then obviously along with like the project management of my flips, um, being a good dad, being a good husband. Um, and that's a time thing too. Like I just got a second kid that's like, doing sports now. So there used to only be one. Mm -hmm. Now I got two. So I was like, okay, now I really got a time block because now I have two kids in sports and I got, I want to be there for them. So, Mm -hmm. so how old are they? Um, almost seven and almost four. Wow. Yeah. And then I have a one year old as well. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Busy busy. busy schedule. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, five years down the road, um, being an owner of a hundred thousand square foot of industrial space, Mm -hmm. Um, and then tier, I would just, and 10 years from now, I would just multiply that for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, getting to a stage where, you know, only putting in 20 hours a week, um, if I want to, um, so yeah, I I really enjoy real estate though. So it's like, sometimes you don't see it as work. Mm -hmm. Um, but having that decision, um, if I want to put that much time into it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good, like. Because whenever you're passionate about something, like you said, it doesn't always feel like work anymore. So, you know, but being able to choose like, okay, I feel like working today. I'm going to do this or, you know, or if you want to go on vacation, just having like the time freedom to do what you want and to be able to, you know, do that stuff is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're passionate about something, it's never going to feel like work. And um, also just, you know, being able to help other people. Mm-hmm. It's super important to me. So through real estate, being able to have other people um, pick your brain and allowing them to make that step into their lives to become financially free, um, super rewarding. You know, my parents were never really into real estate until I got into it, and now we've done several deals together. Oh wow, that's I've awesome. been able to help them, you know, overcome some financial things, and I think we all kind of have that dream to like being able to buy our parents a house or you know buy our, my mom like her dream car. Mm-hmm. Um, so like those are goals in my life as well because you know they helped me they helped raise me I love them to death so yep. just being able to reward them in that aspect that's cool so how uh, how are you able to convince them to get into real estate because I know there's probably a lot of people that really want to do it but then they're scared to take action so like you have a real scenario where you kind of convince them to do it right yeah yeah so just um, kind of proof of concept you know like you know he done a flip house and then done another flip house. And made some money on it, and um, so yeah, they just, just kind of saw what you were doing, and it was like, okay, well, he knows what he's doing. You know, I can invest with him, or however you guys did your splits or whatever. And yeah, then, yeah, just proof of concept, and then just showing them the numbers, like, like, hey, we buy it at this price. This is our remodel numbers. Mm-hmm. We buy, it, you know, buy it at this price, total this price. Like, we literally can't lose unless everything goes to hell, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you yeah. know, if you buy real estate, you know, that's what I tell people all the time. If you buy a good deal, like, you can't lose really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, even if you have to hold it for a year, you know, we've, I've had to hold the house a lot longer than I wanted to, and we still made money on it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the other cool thing about real estate. If you buy a good deal, there's several different exit strategies on that deal. Mm-hmm. You know, you might've initially thought you were going to flip it. Oh, it just became a rental and you re- refinanced $30,000 out tax free yeah. and you still cash flow $300 a month. It's like, mm-hmm. oh wow. I just made $30,000 tax free. And I'm making $300 a month. So you just made money two different ways on that one deal. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Yeah. Right. So 
it's literally like the greatest wealth building tool. Like I, I just, you know, it's crazy. And it's, you know, each year it's just like you get that much more experience whenever you're into it. And Mm -hmm. then it's just like, you can just multiply it like so fast. It's crazy. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, it's super exciting. Like the more we start talking about it, just like gets me happy and excited about it. And then you're talking about tax strategies that save you money, um, creative financing, you know, um, that can help you buy a house at market value Mm -hmm. technically and still make money on it just because of the way the terms are, Yeah, you know? So let's go into that a little bit. And then, uh, I want to kind of touch on, uh, private money as well. Yeah. So, uh, give us some examples of maybe things that you've done, uh, with creative financing. Um, so I actually haven't done any creative finance deals. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just know about it. I guess I've thought about doing it. Um, it just never, it's just never happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so from a legality standpoint, I just didn't want to get into the mess of it because, you know, you can, you can get into some scary situations if you don't have your paperwork correct. Yeah. You know, but let's just use some examples. Like I know plenty of examples and I need to do one just so I have more experience doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, let's just use an example. You buy a house for a hundred thousand, you put a 20,000 into it. Let's just say you're all in 130 thousand mm-hmm. with all of your uh, cost, your holding costs, your, um, commission costs. Let's just throw those in. Right. Um, you're all in 130,000 on the house. Um, you have someone that can't get bank financing, but they say, are, say they're a 1099 employee and they technically make, you know, 200,000. So they have great cash flow. They make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, they just don't show it to the bank. Right. So they can't get bank financing. So how are they going to buy a home? Well, you can be the bank for that person. So you're going to be, um, you're going to be the seller for them, right? The seller finance person for that person, for that person that wants to buy the house and you're going to sell it to them for 200,000, right? You only, you're only in on it 130. Um, you can get a big down payment from that person to show that they're interested in the home and to lower their monthly payment, right? So you agree to terms on $200,000 sale price. They give you thirty thousand dollars down, so their mortgage is one hundred and seventy. Um, you still own the home for one hundred and thirty. Um, your interest rate on the home is five percent, and theirs is nine percent, mm-hmm. right? And some people might think that's high, but you're the one taking all the risks because um, you own the home. And mm-hmm. if they don't, if the person that you're selling it to didn't pay the mortgage, right, then you might and have to foreclose on them, right? You're yeah. just stuck with it. And so, yeah, you have um, the down payment that you made money on because you own the home for 130. They now own it for 170. Mm -hmm. So you have that split. And then you also make the split from the interest rate. So you make money. um, It's almost like I consider it like a flip. You get like kind of like that flip money sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, And you also get the rental money. Um, The beauty of it all is you still technically own the home. So if for some reason um, they um, don't do their part in the contract, right? you can take, take the home back and, and repeat that process. Yeah. So I need to do one. Cause like yeah. the more we talk about it, like it, it's kind of a no brainer, but you want to make sure the legality and the paperwork's right. Mm-hmm. And, um, we have a local agent in my area that's done several and I've picked his brain on it and I've had him kind of coach me through it. I just haven't, haven't done one cause I just see the flip and I'm like, I'll just do that. Yeah. <laughs> so I would like to do one. So do you, do you like doing like burrs? Do you do a lot of burrs? Um, we've done a burr on every rental that we've held. So yeah, burrs are, I mean, it's essentially a burr, but just like a cell. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've done a lot of burrs. Okay. And then let's talk about, uh, you know, raising capital and some of that. So do you, do you typically raise capital for your deals or how do you kind of structure your deals? So it just depends on, um, where you can find money. Yeah. So I've done hard money um, with private lenders, and then I've done bank financing on my deals as well. Um, so we have some local banks that, you know, they do like a construction loan, right? So they'll give you um, 70, 80% of uh, the ARV. So if you can buy a good enough deal, you can purchase that home and have the rehab funds from that bank all in one deal. Um, obviously that's a little bit more of a difficult process because they were going to require all your documents, your tax documents, what you make. Mm -hmm. So you got to go through that process. So it's a little bit of a headache. 
but it's still free money. It's not free money, but it's still money, right? Yeah. Um, and, and then go and ahead. ARV just stands for after repair value, just so everyone knows. Yeah. So that's going to be like, you know, what your home is worth at the end of the day after you remodel it and yeah. what you're going to list it for on the market. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, like, that's one way I like to get money. And then, obviously, hard money is a great way. It's um, They don't loan on you technically. They loan on the asset. Mm -hmm. So if you bring them a good deal, um, most times they will loan to you unless you just have a terrible credit score and, like, no income. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but more times than not, they will. Um, and then because of that, the money is more expensive. So they're going to charge you a higher interest rate, um, points potentially. Um, and they're not going to loan, um, they'll usually learn like 70 to 75% of the purchase of the home and then hundred percent of your rehab. So that's why it's important to have your, um, your rehab dialed in and knowing like, okay, I need this much for the rehab. Yeah. So you can get that hundred percent amount from your hard money lender. And that's where the private person comes in because if the heart is only funding 70, 75% of your purchase, yep. you got to have a relationship with someone that has the money because typically, you know, depending on the purchase of the house, you might need 20, you might need 30, you might need $50,000 mm -hmm. um, to close out on that deal. Yeah. Yep. And so, go ahead. So what's, what is a typical rehab for you? Like my rehabs range from like 60 to 90,000 typically. Yeah. What, what are you usually rehabbing at? Yeah, so that's a little high, but also you had talked about you've done a lot of stud down, like yeah. down to the studs, remodels, so that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so t it just depends on the deal. Like this one that we just closed on last week, it's only going to be a $25,000 rehab. Mm -hmm. So that's a really nice, easy, clean one. Thank you for that because it'll, be, it'll move along very quickly. Yeah. Uh, but then also that one that I told you, um, we bought one in Oklahoma City, um, two hours away from where I live, and that ended up being, it ended up going over... Um, our budgeted uh, rehab, we had budgeted about 80 on that and it ended up being about 105, 110. Ooh, that bites. How'd you guys do on it in the end? We made money. Good. We made money. So that like, I was super conservative with that deal because I'm like, okay, this is two hours away. I'm not going to be there very often. I had a partner in the deal that mm -hmm. was kind of the GC. Um, he's a firefighter, so he still has a life. Right. Mm -hmm. And this was like his only like his second deal. Um, so I'm like, so he's not like super in tune with what should be going on, but he has an idea. He's a smart guy and I'll be dropping in every two to three weeks. So I'm like, if I'm going to even attempt to buy this deal, I'm going to be super conservative with it yeah. to make sure we make money. And so, um, let's see, we bought that for like 170, ended up being all in, you know, probably about 280, 290. And we sold it for three thirty five, nice. so we still made money on it. Yep. Yeah, even after going over budget, holding it longer than we wanted to. That's what I was telling you earlier. Yep. You know, um, bad contractors, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, some people don't like me using that word, bad contractors, but there are bad contractors there out are. there. We went. There was one project I had a partner on, and we went through like three. It took three contractors to finally get us to the finish line. Yeah, it was that was a brutal experience. Took way longer than expected, and I don't. I mean, we still made decent money. We made pretty good money, I think, actually, on that one. But just it was brutal. <laughs> yeah, and you know, the reason I say some people don't like me using that word "bad contractors," I don't think they were bad people. Mm -hmm. I think um, I had a lot to learn during that process as well. Yeah. You know, maybe I could have been better with my communication. Uh, maybe I could have dotted up my contract better um, with what I was looking for in that project. And that's what's cool, man. You learn, you learn, you know, even if you're 20 year experienced person, you learn something from every deal you do. Yeah. Um, so not that they were bad people, I think I can communicate, communicated better. Um, but yeah, just the overall experience was bad. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but we I, made money at the end of the day. Right. So mm -hmm. that's what was nice about it. Yeah. I was kind of thinking about what you said, like, even after doing like a lot of deals, you do really, you like, you kind of give it in a rhythm, but there are still times like wow, this is a lesson here. Like I probably won't ever do this again or whatever. And like, I'm constantly like tweaking our systems and like how we do things and trying to make it better. And just, so I feel like we're at a point where we're starting to like kind of smooth things out and it's, it's getting better, but there's obviously still room to grow. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, um, you know, early we had talked about, I think this might've been on like one of your first flips. You guys have used some handymans and some guys to, to get a project done and you didn't have a good experience with that. But I think if you're truly going to grow, you kind of had to have an in-house team. 
mm-hmm. um, or someone that's like really willing to work with you, like constantly, like every flip, like they're kind of looking to you for their work. Yeah. Um, and even if it's not a work, you know, I have a buddy that um, he does a lot of it his own investing, but it's like, if he doesn't have a house that he knows his team can work on, it's almost like his construction team. Like they're looking for other, they're, they're giving um, quotes to other investors to keep his guys busy. Cause it's mm-hmm. like, at the end of the day, it's his team and he wants to be able to keep food in their mouth and, and pay for their bills. Right. And um, be the leader for them. So I think that would help with your, you know, if you're buttoning up your processes and um, having a proven system, why not have a team that already knows that system? Mm-hmm. That's like, boom, like then I would even speed up your, your rehab times. Cause it's yeah. like, you have this is exactly what we're doing yeah. when we go into a house. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We've uh, talked about it, contemplated that a lot. Like we go back and forth because I don't want to, like, I know it sounds bad, but I don't want to sit there and babysit. Like I have, you know, like I like having contractors that know what they're doing. So there's that avenue, but then there's other times where sometimes the contractors might have other projects. And so they'll go off mine to go do something else. And that, just eats at me. So it's like, I just want someone dedicated to me. So if I did build out that team, that would definitely be a benefit. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've all been there. Um, because you're like, you're paying them to finish your project. And at the end of the day, like the more you, the longer you hold a home, it's money out of your pocket. Um, so you're like, you know, we're on a time crunch to get this done. So, um, yeah, you got to find the happy medium of like finding a contractor that, that understands that, or just having that simple conversation like, hey, are you guys going to be over here every day? Did you have other projects going on? Um, you know, I think we could all be a little bit more communica- communicative and asking those difficult questions mm-hmm. um, because they're uncomfortable conversations to have sometimes. But I think the more we have them, the easier they become. Yeah, you know? I think you're right. And um, so, yeah, it's like getting out of that comfort zone and, and becoming comfortable with the uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So right now, what's your favorite type of real estate? Do you like the flips? Do you like, you know, your apartments or commercial? What's your... Yeah, I'd say like that's my bread and butter is flips for sure. Um, It's just constant, you know, cash flow for the most part. Um, Mm -hmm. Something that I know, I know like the back of my hand, like how to make money on one. It's just finding a deal, right? Yeah. Um, And looking towards the future, I think it's like putting all that money into... um, industrial commercial flex space um yeah because as i learned that i feel like um the leases are set up more in favor for the landlord Mm -hmm. Um, not that they're anything bad for the tenant it's just you know the way the leases are set up in an industrial um contract Mm -hmm. um so i i really like that um which is nice because in residential it's it's mainly like the tenant has all the rights yeah yeah and um you know, as I've been doing more research on industrial, it's kind of like untapped right now in the amount of space that is really needed. Mm-hmm. Um, Especially in your market. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I've been trying to listen to more industrial um, podcasts and it's just like, if you think about being a principal owner and starting a company um, on the industrial side, um, the mom and pop ones, um, there's not many of them. Like you have mm-hmm. your big major players that own so much you know hundreds of millions of square footage of industrial yeah so it's like well they're tackling like you know um tilt up um buildings for amazon or you know these um national multi-million dollar companies but what about you know the typical hvac company that's making you know um, half a million dollars every year that needs twenty thousand square foot Mm -hmm. so it's like that's an untapped market right there of someone that needs ten thousand twenty thousand square foot um of, of hundreds of millions of mom and pop, um, businesses mm-hmm. and you could be, you know, that, um, answer to them, yeah. you know? So what, what do you mean by principal owner? Like, I know our audience probably won't know exactly what you mean by that. Yeah. Just being the owner, um, okay. of the building. So, you know, when you start getting into raising money, like, you know, millions of dollars, you have your GPs, your general partners and your, um, LPs, your limited partners. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so your GPs are basically your owners, your limited partners are basically your investors into that building. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, your limited partners can become equity owners, um, and have like actual ownership in the building, Mm -hmm. but for the most part, your principals are going to be, um, your, your LPs are going to be just cash investors. So in your opinion, how important is business with God? Like, do you mix the two together? Do you keep them separate? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I think you got to keep them together, um, at least for me, because um, 
I feel like it gives you a morality point of like how to interact with people and business. Mm -hmm. Like I'm never above someone. Yeah. I might've learned more than someone. I might be in a different stage in my life than someone, but I'm never above someone. Yeah. Um, so I treat people like that. I don't want to downgrade anyone just because they're swinging a hammer and I'm swinging a phone and, you know, talking to someone. Mm. Um, so I think that's just a good, like, you know, the Bible and Jesus, um, gives you a good basis of like how to live morally. Some people, you know, they'll say, well, he doesn't teach you right and wrong. Like, well then how do you know what's right and wrong? Like, you know, in your soul, like when you see something, um, if that is not the right thing, yeah, you know, and there's a reason for that, you know, cause God created us. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, I think you have to intertwine the two. Um, it helps you set up your, at least for me, like company goals. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like if you are a true Christian, like no matter what, like that should shine through everything. Like it should be in a way it should be kind of obvious that you're a Christian because of how you do business and how you live your life. So yeah, no, a hundred percent dude. Like, you know, some people don't understand like, you know, um, it's, it's a spiritual war, a spiritual war. Yeah. And so if you don't have something to lean on to, um, I think the devil's going to attack you and just beat Make you down to the dumps. so much harder. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, you know, we talked about earlier, like failing forward. Well, if you don't have something to lean on to and something to look up to and something to talk to and get you through your tough times, um, I think you're going to stay down there for a while, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, you know, that's why you have to believe in yourself. And who's going to teach you to believe in yourself? I think Jesus does. Yeah. It's because he wants you to be a leader. He wants you to lead other people. Mm -hmm. He wants you, he wants people to see you um, and realize that something's possible, even when you do fail, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. That's one of my favorite verses. Yeah. So Was it Proverbs? Proverbs 16, 30, I think it's 16.3. 16, 3. 3. Yeah. yeah. I think, unless I'm mistaken, but yeah. Yeah, mine is um, 2 Timothy 1.7. Um, For God not give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and self-discipline. Yeah, that's a really good one. Yeah. I love that. So don't be fearful. Take action. Love people. Um, have self-discipline with yourself. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there anything that you do that uh, some people might think is odd? Like... So some, one of the things I started doing is I'll take a cold bath or a cold shower and then I'll go to the gym, then go get home, do a cold plunge, then take another cold shower. <laughs> and then it's like, to me, it's like doing something that's difficult that not very many people are willing to do. And so, and then usually I'll try to, uh, four days a week, I'll try to run seven miles each, each four days a week. So, uh, I just try to create like a more difficult thing that I have to overcome every day. Yeah. Dude, that's awesome, man. Um, now my wife could say I probably do a lot of weird things, but, uh, <laughs> you know, like we talked about earlier, um, you're getting in that uncomfortable state to create that self-discipline in yourself to yeah. do hard things. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I don't know if you listen to Andy Priscilla at all, but I, I know who he is. I love that but... guy. Cause you know, I don't know. I just, I just like his vibe. I like what he speaks. Um, and you got to do hard things. Um, so what do I do? Um, I love cold plunges. Um, I don't have a tub yet. So like I had bought a cheap one off mm -hmm. Amazon and I like, okay, this isn't working out. Like I got to get a better one. So I'll just do cold showers for now. Mm -hmm. And then other than that, I just, um, just work out quite a bit. Um, I want to get a cold plunge in a sauna. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have that soon, I think, after this next flip. Um, yeah. Nice. Yeah. I don't – I need to get into running. Yeah, because, like – so I still play men's league baseball. I'm still trying to, like I told oh, you cool. earlier, like be that 40-year-old that, that throws 90. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, man, I need to get back into doing my cardio. Like I'll just do cardio at the gym. Mm -hmm. But there's something about running and outside, you know, getting that sun, getting that vitamin D, yeah. um, and just freeing yourself. And it, it's – it's nice. It really is like, yeah. and I just, for, for whatever reason, kind of habitually just get on the treadmill, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah. I, uh, like I just can't get on the treadmill anymore. Like yeah. I, uh, 
like at the gym I go to, there's like a place to run upstairs. So I'll mm-hmm. run around the, it's basically above the basketball court. So I'll run there. And then when it's nice out, I run up the golf course. Nice. So that's not, and you always have like the golf course is pretty. So you have scenery and stuff. And mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what's your favorite business book? Oh man. Um, I don't read ever. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, and I haven't read in a while to be honest. Um, it was almost like, um, I didn't want to get too much in analysis paralysis and like just trying to consume, 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 and then like not taking action. Mm-hmm. So I kind of cut off the books for a little bit. Cause I'm like, what I'm doing now, like I understand. So like, I'm going to, re- I'm going to read something. I need to read something completely out of my realm. And that's where, um, I don't even know the name of the book right now, but I've been, like I said, trying to dive more into the industrial stuff. So I've been doing more of that, like reading books for that. Cause like it's new information to me. So yeah. Um, you're just trying to surround yourself with as much information as you can be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously the easy generic answer is rich dad, poor dad. Mm -hmm. Um, that was a pretty important book when I first started. I mean, for a lot of people, because it completely shifts your mindset from like seeing what's out there and what's available through real estate and just investing in general, like realizing, um, how money works, the power of money, um, so that's a really good book. It really is. And it's so crazy because that was written so long ago, I but know. it's a good book. Yeah. Um, it's definitely helped change our life. So yeah. That was awesome. Dude, it's a good book. I mean, I still recommend that to people all the time. Yeah. Um, we'll just leave it at that. We'll say Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Okay. Yeah. 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 Is there something that makes you more successful now than you used to be? Like something that you do now or because of you, like knowing something that's like, applicable to pretty much anyone that they can use to make themselves more successful too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a great answer. Um, a great question. I'm sorry. Um, I would say following up with people. I used to not be very good at follow up. Um, and I realized like how important it is. Like if you're in a business that does sales, um, which is basically what a lot of real estate is. Mm -hmm. Um, I think following up with people is super important. And then also just, um, relationships, just always building relationships. Like don't be, um, don't be satisfied with your current state. Always be reaching out to people, um, building relationships because you don't know where it could take you. Yeah. Like me and you building this podcast, um, could build your business in a way you would never even known, you know, exactly, me yeah. sharing it with my friends, you sharing it with your friends, might meet new people through that. And then you meet someone that has a hundred million dollars that wants to strictly work with you. Yeah. Right. That's one thing Ryan Panetta has credited his success to like, being so present in the social media space, meeting new people. Um, and then you have those people that like, okay, I trust this guy. He's a good guy. He knows what he's doing. Um, I want to work with him. Yeah, exactly. So always meeting new people, no matter if you're doing real estate or, or any business, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to grow your business if you meet new people. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, I think I, that's super important. Um, when I was younger, like I was actually super extroverted. Um, even doing podcasts sometimes can be hard for people, right? But it's like, Like we talked about earlier, like getting uncomfortable, man. Like you just got to go do it. You got to go take action. You got to believe in yourself. And so, um, yeah, man, it's, it's awesome. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, it's like, I, I've actually recognized that this year too. Like once I started doing the podcast, like more people are reaching out and, and trying to like build relationships with me and they've actually opened doors for me in areas that I wouldn't have ever thought like this overlaps, like. Like people, I guess my, my, uh, my net network has grown so much that like, I don't know, there's just been a lot more opportunities for me. So that's been really neat. Yeah. I think that that saying, you know, um, you're the average of the five people you surround yourself with. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, who do you want to surround yourself with? Like multimillionaires or, you know, just your every, everyday average person, Mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that. But you know, I have high expectations and big plans and futures for my family and my kids. And so, um, because of that, I want to surround myself with that type of atmosphere and environment. Mm -hmm. So, but also I think an an important part is those type of multimillionaires that are ethical and like faith-based, like people that you trade places with and, and like their lifestyle reflects what you want. Absolutely. And that's where, you know, going back to faith, like I feel like being grounded in our faith and knowing what you expect out of those people is super important because, you know, I've had partners in deals that I feel are good people, but they're not necessarily the people I want to surround myself with, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. 
So what struggles have you encountered and what did you do to get through that? Yeah. Um, I think just on the, you know, flipping side, investing side, um, some struggles you can, you know, easily identify are just good contractors and just, you know, um, a contractor that you mesh well with and has the same vision as you do. So those are some things that can give you some headaches, like, you know, um, timetables not being met, um, you know, um, qu- uh, quality is not there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like there's just things that are just small little headaches that just drive you up the wall that make your day more stressful, make your week more stressful. So if you can, um, identify those early and, you know, find that, that person or just have that, that hard conversation with them early, like this is your expectations mm-hmm. and you can avoid that. Yeah. Yeah. What about, what about you? Um, for me, I mean, I would kind of agree with you on the contractor thing. That's always been kind of a pain point. Like not always, I guess, but like, I think in this business, that's typically a pain point is like getting the work done on time with the quality on budget, Mm -hmm. you know, having all these things line up perfectly. Like, cause it's, there's so many unknowns, especially for flips. Like you never know what you're going to run into or whatever, Yeah. but trying to navigate those problems and, and getting through them. Yeah, I'd say another one, just um, thinking about it, is um, wholesalers. Yeah. Gotta love wholesalers. Yeah. Like, There's a lot you of do, unethical ones. Though. Right, like, wholesalers are great for the business. I really do, I do believe that. I mean, I get a majority of my deals from wholesalers. Yeah. But the thing that'll frustrate me occasionally are national wholesalers not knowing the market, really. Mm-hmm. Um, not knowing true rehab numbers. And so <laughs> That's the it's just frustrating one. when you're, you're um, underwriting, you know, 20 deals and you might get one Mm -hmm. and um, which that's pretty typical, but it's just frustrating when it's so far off, Yeah, you know, like they're asking 170, like just the other day I, they were asking 170, I offered 115 and I like, yeah, there's a little notes section. And I'm like, if you want me to be your guy to do your boots on the ground, like you guys need to do more due diligence because I don't think you understand one, what this house is worth and like how much work it needs to get it to that ARV. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a little frustrating on that aspect because I'm like, man, like, Often on this deal, $15,000, $20,000, like, you know, like, and it's like, it shouldn't be like that. Like, I understand they're trying to make money. Like, I get that. But like. Then they, a lot of them will inflate their numbers to say the ARV is really high and it only needs $30,000 worth of work when it's 90,000 or 60,000. Yeah. Like they. That's, that's why I I really think flipping is so important because if you can understand how a flip works and the true numbers on a flip, you can become a good wholesaler. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't know how many of these deals are busting for these um, wholesalers because they can't get a buyer for it. But I would assume a lot if, unless my numbers are just way off, which, you know, I don't think they are. Um, Mm -hmm. I've never lost money on one deal. I've broken even. I've never lost money on one deal. Um, And, I've you know, I haven't done a whole lot. I've probably done about 20 flips. But, you know, that tells me right there, like, my numbers are are doing okay. Yeah. And so... um, if they can, if they learned flipping first, like wholesaling is the easy, easy way out, mm-hmm. honestly, right? Like every, you're, you don't have any, way, most people like start with wholesale and then they move on to flips. Right. But I've actually never done the wholesale side. Um, there is a couple properties I can think of right now that I might, you know, I have an opportunity to try to wholesale it if I want to, but I don't know if I want to go down that road or not. And the only initial risk they have in the deal are, are marketing dollars, mm-hmm. you know? So. And with marketplace and stuff, you almost you might not even need it. Yeah, yeah, you could technically not market it at all. You could, you know, um, or if you have a list built to other investors and just send it to them. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's a little bit of headache that I've encountered. Mm -hmm. Something that could stress you out throughout the day, and and not it shouldn't have to be there. You know, but you learn to deal with those stresses and move on about your day and take it as a positive rather than a negative that you get to do this work. You get to be in real estate. You get to have these problems. Mm-hmm. So it is, that's uh some, some days it's hard to remember. Like it's a, pr- pr- it's a privilege. Like I'm doing what I've always dreamed about doing. Right. Like I get to live my life. Like some people might be stuck in a, in a job or whatever that they hate. And I'm here doing what I love and you're going to have difficult days. Like you have to make difficult decisions mm-hmm. and stuff. But ultimately, I feel like we're both really blessed to be in the positions that we are. Absolutely, yeah. You couldn't have said it better. Like, we get to do that. Yeah. yeah. So what's one of the best lessons that you've learned in your life? Man, there's lots of lessons that we've learned in our life, right? That's a good <laughs> question. Um, 
The best one, I mean, it's kind of a tough one because we go back and forth on it. I would say like trusting your gut, mm. like just really trusting your gut. Like, What if your gut's always wrong? <laughs> I don't know, man. I feel like most of the time our gut's right. And sometimes we make the wrong decision and we go against what we thought mm-hmm. we should have done. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think trusting your gut, to be honest. Like, obviously, you get some others' opinions that you that you value their opinions. Mm-hmm. Um, not just anyone. You just don't, you know, someone that you truly value their opinion. Someone that you would want to be in their position, right? You yeah. wouldn't go ask, like, someone that's making less than you that necessarily, that has nothing to do with real estate, their opinion on what you should do with real estate, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of people do that, by the way. They'll yeah. go to the wrong person to ask advice. They say it's a bad idea, even though it was a good idea. And they'll just be like, oh, they didn't think it was a good idea. And then they'll ask another wrong person and they'll say the same thing. Like, oh, everyone says it's a bad idea. I shouldn't do this. Yeah. Or they'll be around negative people that are like, uh, they say like any opportunity is like, oh, but this could happen. Like any, they anything, don't see the vision. They won't ever take the risk because yeah. yeah, they don't see the vision. They don't. Yeah. That's where like, I don't know. Real estate just really gave me like that entrepreneurial bug um, mm-hmm. because some people just don't get it. They don't see the vision. And they aren't willing to take the risk and take the action. But I feel like if you trust yourself and you can really just go after it, like, what do you have to lose? Like, all you're going to do is put yourself in the same position you're already in. Or you look at the upside. Oh, I just learned this valuable lesson. I learned all this new information and I just made money doing it. Mm -hmm. And now you can take it into the next project and the next project and learn something new from each project and each transaction and meet people along the way. Mm -hmm. Um, it's getting out of that comfort zone because a lot of people are extroverted and you got to get out of it um, and, and be willing to take the risk and take action. So trust in your gut, um, even if it's telling you to not do something, mm-hmm. um, you know, you can look at it that way. Cause sometimes you do need to like hold back yep. and, and look at the big picture, the 40,000 foot view picture of what this looks like, you know, four months down the road, six months down the road, a year down the road. Um, and go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything in your business that you can think of that you're scared to do, but you know, you need to do it? Oh yeah, man. Um, social media. Yeah. Yeah. Um, been going through those ups and downs of like posting a lot and then not posting a lot. Um, you know, ultimately I really don't care what people think about, but in the back of my mind, I think it gets to me a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, because I want to be a good presence and I want to be a good figure to my family mm-hmm. and to my kids. And some of the things that we talk about are very controversial in this world because no one in this world is a go-getter, unfortunately. Um, you have the few, right? Um, but when you're a go-getter and you're achieving things, people start to badmouth you because they think you've done something unethical. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, I actually worked my tail off for all of this mm-hmm. and I did it ethically. Yeah. And you can too. It's not It's not as hard as people make it out to be. To be. Mm-hmm. You just um, have to find the right thing for you. You have to find the right thing for you. You have to find people that are like-minded. You have to surround yourself like all we've been talking about. It's yeah. like, it's all in the it's same bubble. It's not one thing. It's not like you just do this one time and you're successful. Like right. It's like an ongoing thing. Like you're, It's like training. Yeah. So. It's just training. It's training yourself um, in those daily habits of like doing that on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. You know, people think you're supposed to get rich in a year. Um, make a million dollars in a year, which is achievable. Like I've thought to myself, I'm sure you have, like if I do this many deals in one year, in, in, in one year, I can make a million dollars and it's possible. You just have to go get it. Like, why would you have a limited belief set that you can't go make a million dollars like and change your life forever? Right. Yep. But also on the other side of that, like maybe that's a very lofty goal for someone's just starting. Mm. Um, maybe they started a hundred thousand and then you achieve it. It's like, Oh dang, that's awesome. So like having that big, like I said, 40,000 square foot view of like, oh, I can make a million dollars in two years or I can make, you know, 10 million in five years, whatever the case may be. Um, just believe in yourself. Like it's that simple mm-hmm. and don't let anyone talk you out of that. Yeah. And like you said, you mentioned like the numbers, like how many flips does it take to hit this? Yeah. Like I do that too. Like, you know, it's just math. Like it's math. you just do this this many times it's, and you get this result. So. It's elementary math at that. Like yeah, anyone could do that, right? That like, yeah. come on. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. So what advice would you give someone that really wants to succeed in life or business? Yeah, I would say a um, couple things there, like follow your gut, right? Um, well, 
follow your passion, right? Like just mm-hmm. find something that you're passionate about and go get it. Like find the steps, you know, break it down, uh, brainstorm, break it down. And what are the steps to be able to be successful in that endeavor? Mm-hmm. Right. And then too, along that, like you're going to encounter a lot of failure. So surround yourself with people that are going to lift you up and that also have um, experience in that space because they're going to give you the tips, the tricks that you need to learn um, along the way mm-hmm. to get you past those failures. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple, honestly. I think we make it a lot harder than what we need to. Yep. Um, and the other thing is that, uh, to touch on what you were saying is unknown unknowns. Like you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Like you think you might've screwed up here, but you maybe go to a mentor and they're like, Oh, that's not a big deal. You can just pivot and do this instead. Like what if you bought, you overpaid for a house and you keep, if you're like, I, 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 I'm going to flip this house and I'm expecting to make this much, but then you go way over budget and you're like, crap, I can't flip anymore. Well, could you turn it into a rental? Could you do something different? And, yeah. in, and not even just in real estate, it could be something else, but you might have a mentor that's like, oh, you didn't really make a mistake. You just do this differently yeah. and turn it into a win. Yeah, absolutely. Like that was the thing I was going to say next actually was don't be afraid to ask questions. Like mm-hmm. no one ever is going to know it all. Like we're always learning, we're always evolving, whether it's in real estate, whether it's in business, um, whether it's learning to do a triathlon, right? Yep. There's people that probably do triathlons, like, which is like, to me, like one of the hardest things in the world to do. Yeah. And um, you might learn like, oh, I could have better technique with my swimming, even though I've done it for 20 years. I just learned this new technique. I tried it out. It works better for me. Mm-hmm. You know, what works for someone might not work for you exactly. and vice versa. Yeah. So always be afraid to ask those questions to learn from those. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What legacy do you want to leave? Like, uh, let's talk a little bit about like family legacy and then like how you want to be remembered and then maybe like, you know, real estate portfolio, stuff like that. Yeah, uh, man, there's just some good questions, deep questions. I've never really thought about it that hard other than just... Um, being a good leader for my family, you know, um, teaching my kids about faith and how important it is to you. Like that should be your base, your foundation. Um, and kind of going off of that. So like being a leader in your community, being a leader in your family, um, being a leader on your t-ball team, baseball team, whatever, right? Like it's just important to have that foundational faith and then also being able to have the confidence to do what you say you're going to do. Yeah. Um, and then if you don't, big deal. Like pivot, um, fail forward. You know, you learn so many lessons through failure. Yeah. And so um, that'd be my legacy. Like not being afraid to take risk and not being afraid with um, just the st- like being stagnant, being still, and just um, just continue to move forward. With with everything, like your physical fitness, I think that's a very important, um, and helps, you know, it helps you think better. I mean, if you think about it, like in all aspects, it helps you um, physically, mentally, helps you be more sharp. So um, that's super important to me. So I want my kids to be healthy. I want them to be fit, and then also take that into you know the business side and um, creating relationships with people. Um, So yeah, I'd say like that's what I'm on legacy to be. What about some of the other stuff like the real estate? Like, do you have like goals on like where you want your portfolio to be or what you want to do with it? Like, do you want to pass it on to your kids or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't have like a specific number in mind because I think that always changes, especially as you're growing. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, hopefully it's just moving forward, right? And getting bigger. Yeah. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Like pass along to them. Um, I think. At the same time, though, like we have to instill those those um, that grit and like that strength and toughness, and allow our kids to learn yeah. and not allow things to be handed to them. So I know, like I've seen like Grant Cardone and like other you know people on the socials like talk about um, my kids aren't going to get anything till they're eighteen or at so and so age and have contracts written up. I I love that if you think about it because you don't want to just hand it to them because you know they say sometimes that generational wealth only lasts like you know. Um, what one one and a half generation or something, mm-hmm. whatever the number is, right? It doesn't last as long as you would think, even if you have hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. And that's because the the generations under us aren't learning the lessons that we learned. Mm-hmm. So if you can, um, like the like the saying, strong men create 
uh, easy times, easy, easy times, times create, create weak men. Yes. Yeah. And then weak men create hard times. Yeah. And then hard times create strong men. So it's like a cycle, right? Yeah. So if you can continually develop your kids and, and having and learn and gaining experience, just like we had, hopefully that could carry over quite a bit. And then they just have the financial assets to even expand it even more. Exactly. Um, but they definitely have to learn the lessons. I was listening to a really good podcast um, on the way here called Undaunted Life. Hmm. And I um, highly encourage uh, you to listen to it. And it's more like um, faith-based, but it's just, um, it's got a lot of different aspects like, you know, um, faith, uh, how to raise um, boys to men. Um, I think it has a couple of tactical things in there, pretty sure, like from actual tactical perspective, like guns and ammo and stuff like oh, that. And so um, that's one. they actually said that on the podcast, on the podcast, you know, weak men create hard times and so forth. So it's like, you have to be able to allow your kids to experience life. And we're so sheltered in today's world, um, which, you know, there's a lot of evil in this world, but to a point you got to be able to allow them to experience and learn somehow. Mm -hmm. It's okay if they fall off the bike, you know, they're going to get scratches. They're going to get bruises. So they got to learn from those. Yeah, absolutely. That was a really good example. Yeah. How can people connect with you? Um, yeah, man. Um, just on all the socials, um, Instagram, Facebook, uh, my Instagram's the Brandon Vargas. Um, same thing with Facebook. Um, I do have a TikTok. I actually, I was doing good on there for a little while and then I've kind of just haven't done anything, but I think that's uh, the Brandon Vargas as well. Um, my company is generation homes. Uh, my website called buyhomesok.com. So, yeah, I mean, talking about um, my legacy, like that's kind of why I named my company Generation Homes because, like, I want to leave a lasting generation for my kids mm-hmm. and, like, help them for generations and help people for generations. That's Because cool. that's what's cool about real estate, too. Like, obviously, we're building ourselves or building our own companies, but, like, a simple real estate transaction for someone else, like, say you're buying a house from someone, could help transform their lives. Like, maybe they're in a distressed situation and they need that money to, to help better their lives in whatever way. Um, and then also, you know, people kind of um, like to make fun of flippers because they like think we're doing something to the market or we're like doing a bad flip and not making a house what it should be up to code. But it's like, well, one, that's where kind of faith comes into play, like being ethical mm-hmm. and doing things the right way. But also, like, do you understand how many people are going through a transaction in real estate? Like you're talking about um, the contractors, um, how many different contractors, right? Painters, um, tile guys, framers, like roofers, so many different things, right? Yeah. You have the title company, you have lenders. Um, I mean, there's, I can name several few, I'm sure, but like so many different people that are transacted in, in one deal that you're helping their lives. And if so imagine if transactions were happening, Yeah. like all those people all are affected, these people, yeah. all these different, um, businesses are affected. So it's pretty cool. It is cool. Like I never really think about it like that, but you are, you're affecting more people than you think. Yeah. So, yeah, it's exciting, man. Like you're literally um, changing your community by doing real estate Mm -hmm. in a better, in a better way. And I mean, most people, when they buy a house, they're really excited. So you're, you're giving someone a product that like they're really excited about and um, like, it's a big event in their life. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. First time home buyers are awesome. Like to kind of see that excitement on their face, like, cause we never mentioned I'm like a licensed real estate agent as well. So I've helped a couple first time home buyers and you're exactly right. Like seeing that excitement on their face. Yeah. 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 Uh, So do you have a final message for our audience? I'd say, um, you know, if you're interested in real estate, reach out to Jason, Um, reach out to me. Um, I'm sure we can guide you in the right direction. Um, be, Be happy to answer any questions you guys have. And don't be afraid to take those risks and get into action, you know, take action. Um, you know, it's going to take some knowledge. You're going to have to learn some. Um, but along the way, you're going to have failures, and that's okay. Just surround yourself with good people, and you'll be able to get through it. Um, yeah, I mean, just take action. Yeah, and believe in yourself. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys for watching the Karima Podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next video.